Lord God, we recognize that every time we open this book, you talk to us in the most clearest form. There is no fog. There is nothing unclear, Lord God, when your spirit shines light on what you want to say to us through your living word. And today, Lord God, I pray that we would be meek and humble receivers of your word. And that our pride wouldn't block the seed that produces your character. But that we would receive your word with joy. As one who is hungry for bread or one who is thirsty for water. We are hungry and thirsty for you, Lord. And so I pray that you would continue to show us what it means to grow in Christ likeness. What it means to live the life that is the crucified life, the life of self-denial and the life of exalting Christ, having that be attitude, Lord. I ask that you would have your way with us today. We are excited to meet with you, Lord. We incline our ear. And we ask that you speak to us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue to snail through the Beatitudes and to view the Beatitudes as a Greek marble pillar going up one drum at a time, we are now on the third drum, which is blessed are the meek. I told you that. When you look at the Beatitudes, there's eight in total, and it's like erecting a marble pillar, a Greek marble, beautiful, beautifully carved pillar. And one thing we must understand is this is a progression. It's a progression in the Christian life. It's becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. And so the first thing that we learned was that we must be poor in spirit which basically means that we are spiritually bankrupt. We have nothing to offer God. We are like poor, broke beggars before the Lord, and He blesses us and gives to us all that we need, especially His righteousness and His life. And then after that, we mourn. Why do we mourn? Because we recognize that we're poor in spirit. We recognize that when we look back, our whole life has been a trail of failures and sins. We have never honored God perfectly, and so we weep about it. We cry. Tears mark the life of one who is truly meek in the sight of God. So I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read verse 5. A short verse, but a very powerful verse. And I would ask you to please stand to your feet as we read this verse together. Matthew 5, 5 reads, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You may be seated. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The Greek word for meek here is the word praus. And what it means is mild, gentle, and humble. And so that when you read that passage, what it's saying is, Blessed are the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. In other words, someday the new heavens and the new, new earth will be yours. The fullness of who God is and everything that God owns is going to finally be yours. It's, gonna, it's already yours, but it's going to be in your hands. It's going to be in your possessions. All that God has created, all that God is, belongs to those who are meek. Humble before the Lord. Another way to look at this is to say, to be meek is to be marked by Christ-like humility. So this isn't just any type of humility like, I want to be as humble as the guy next door. Right? I want to be as humble as Christ Jesus himself. That's the standard. That's the mark. We'll never reach it to its perfect level here on this side of eternity, but that's the goal, right? To be humble like Jesus Christ. And if there's one thing, church, that I encourage you to get on this side of eternity, it's humility. And all of you're getting 
get humility. Humility is the primary thing, trust me. Humbling yourself before the Lord, putting Him before you, putting His ways before you, putting people before you, which isn't always easy. Can I get an amen? But how do you get this humility? We have to remember that gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. Humility is a fruit of the Spirit. So you can't manufacture Jesus' humility. You can try all you want, but it's impossible apart from His Spirit. So, so you need Him, right? He's the one that bears this fruit through you. Who does? The Holy Spirit of God. So how do we get this humility? One, we recognize it doesn't come from us. It's supernatural. It comes from the Holy Spirit. But not only that, we get it through studying God in Scripture. That's the reason why theology is so important, so vital to the Christian. If you don't know God, you can never imitate Him. And that's what we're told in Scripture, aren't we? Imitate God as dear children. So then the first thing we recognize that it, it's a fruit of the Spirit. Secondly, we study God in Scripture. When we read scriptures, we ask questions like, what is, what is God like? What is His character? Why does He make this decision here? And why does He make that decision over there? And why does He hate that so much? Fire came down from heaven and burnt those cities up. And why does He love this over here? And so you go through scripture and you begin to understand who God is. And the more you understand who God is, the more humble you become. Why? Because the greater you are, you are growing in your understanding of who He is, there's a greater and greater light and you see Him great and awesome and good and perfect. And it just automatically humbles you. And it's a beautiful kind of humbling. God is not condescending. God is a Father to us. But He wants us to look at Him as great and as wonderful and as awesome. And when we do that, we become more and more humble in spirit. And blessed are the humble, for theirs and theirs alone is the earth. Amen? They will inherit the earth. And especially by studying the life of Jesus Christ. The most meek individual who has ever stepped foot on this earth has been Christ. How do you become humble? Study Him. Don't just read about Him. Don't just hear about Him. Don't just sing about Him. But study Him. Read the Bible to know Jesus. Why did He turn the, the, the tables in the temple why did he create a whip? Why was he so hard on the Pharisees? Why was he demanding that man surrender everything to him or else they cannot have him? Why? Why did Jesus say the things he said? Why was he so challenging? Why were his words so piercing? How is it that he made time for the woman at the well? How was it that he made time for the droves of broken people who came to him every single day? On a constant basis, Jesus was in ministry 24-7, basically. The only time he took a time off was when he went into the mountains to spend time with his father and recharge. You look at the life of Jesus Christ and you wonder why. Why did he step in when the Pharisees were about to rock the woman who was caught in the very act of adultery? Why being God would he put on human flesh and then crucify it and then raise it up from the dead again? Why? And you read about God and you read about his son and you grow in the knowledge of who he is and it automatically humbles you inside. And after you do all that, you pray and you pray again and you pray some more. And all you do is ask, God, help me to be more like you. Jesus, give me more of your character. I want more measures of your character, Lord. I'm failing, I'm stumbling, I'm tripping over everything. 
I'm tired of me, Lord. And that becomes your routine. Like a poor beggar who is a child of the living God, and yet he's in need of everything God has to provide, right? That's how you become humble. Wait a minute, I got, I got to pray? <laughs> yes. The humble and the needy pray. The prideful and those who don't see a need for God don't pray. Right? It takes work, but it's the right kind of work. It's humbling one's heart before God to get all that He is. By the way, many people were attracted to Jesus in His day. Many people were attracted to Jesus in His day. He was honey, they were bees. And they swarmed all around Him all the time. And the reason why was because He was nothing like the Pharisees. The Pharisees were full of self-righteousness and pride and they pushed their religious weight on people. I know more than you. I'm better than you and so on. And the Lord was nothing like them. The Pharisees didn't want to be around the lowly. The Pharisees didn't want to be around the homeless. The Pharisees didn't want to be around the worst sinners in town. Not Jesus. Where are they? Set up a table. Go ahead and call me their friends. I've come to save them, change them. And so they, they were drawn by his meekness. They were drawn by his humility. It was very attractive. By the way, pride is the greatest repellent. You want to know the secret to not win souls? Just be prideful. Just be rude. Just be mean. And you will never win anyone for Jesus. Guaranteed. You want to win a soul? Humble yourself. Act like Jesus Christ. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Be the salt. Be the light. Win somebody. Amen? If you want to win some, you need to become more winsome. That's the way it works. If you want to win some, you have to become more winsome. Who is the most winsome individual? Jesus Himself. And I hope He's your mark today, because He's my mark. He's my mark. The Bible says that He is meek and lowly. That's what He says. I am, I am meek and lowly. But we're going to touch upon that in a moment. That point a little later. What I'm going to do is try and describe to you what meekness looks like. Because it's easier to describe meekness than it is to define meekness. Because if I say that meekness is just humility and we all went home, well, we have some understanding about what humility is. But there are certain things that we find in Scripture that describe humility in a way that is clear to us. And so I see this word meekness like a diamond with many sides. Meekness has many sides in the sense that we can appropriate it and live it out in many different ways. So I'm going to share some ways with you in which we can be meek in the sight of others in regards to how we carry ourselves, all right? A truly meek person, again, is a truly humble-hearted person. He's the kind of individual that says, I came into this world with nothing and I will leave this world with nothing and everything that I have came from God so there's no room for pride why because everything you have and are came from God that alone is humbling that allows no individual to be prideful what you're wearing came from God yes they came from his fields his cotton fields right the vitamin D that you enjoy every day, especially in Tucson, Arizona, comes from God. That sun, that big hot ball in the sky, it's His. The air you breathe, that's His oxygen. The skin that wraps your bones, that's His too. Everything you have, everything you are, every penny you make, every thought that you have, the mind you have, the soul you have, the family you have, the kids you have, the car you drive, everything comes from the hand of God. Nothing exists apart from it coming from His good hand. So that alone makes us humble, doesn't it? 
It should. There are far too many people taking pride in what they drive and what they wear and what they can do. All of that is absolute silliness because it came from God. They are humble because they are keenly aware that God is in full control of everything. Why are the meek meek? Because they recognize that God is in control of the good, bad, and ugly in our lives. They realize that putting God and others first is actually a better way and a more peaceful way to live. Again, how is humility gained? in greater measures. It's to constantly deny one's sinful desires, doesn't stop there, and constantly exalt Jesus Christ. I must decrease and Christ must increase. That's how you grow in humility. You take your eyes off yourself and you put them on the Lord and you want to glorify Him with all that you are, all that you say, all that you think, and all that you do. You want to grow in humility? Live like that. Die to your old sinful ways and grow in the character of Jesus Christ. Exalt Him. Exalt him. The meek individual detects pride in his heart right away. And as soon as he finds that pride in his heart, he could be going throughout the day and he says something he shouldn't have said or thought something he shouldn't have thought or did something he shouldn't have done. And then he comes before the Lord in prayer and God shows it to him. He repents of it and he takes it to God ASAP that he would remove it. It's like an individual that is told he has a tumor. What does he do? Let's get to the doctor. Let's get this out of here today. Possible. The meek man knows when he is prideful. He knows it. It bothers him. He runs to God. He says, take it out. Take it out. The humble person is not humble because he's void of all pride. Because as you and I both know, none of us are void of pride. The only one that was void of pride is Jesus Christ himself, right? He conquered pride completely. But you and I, were still battling this sinful flesh at times. We're still battling this pride within us. But what does the meek man do? He recognizes it and he takes it to God right away. And he allows God to deal with it. He allows God to deal with it. Always. It's a way of life for him. It's a pattern. Every day, come before the Lord. Lord <clears throat> search my heart, O oh God. Psalm 139. Get rid of all the wicked. Get me, right back, get me back on the right track again. This is a, a daily walk with God. Amen? Amen? On the other hand, a prideful person hardly ever sees his faults. A prideful woman hardly ever sees her faults. And anytime anybody tries to bring them up, they'll deny it. I didn't say that. I didn't mean that. I'm not like that. You're tripping. <laughs> but the humble person sees most of his flaws and he mourns over them before God. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. A meek disciple is one who has his desires under submission. He holds any sinful inclinations and cravings down. He or she is highly self-controlled. They live the happy crucified life, which is not the easy life, but it's the happy life nonetheless. They're always denying themselves. They're always denying the pride that tries to rise up within them. Always. The meek are not easily irritated. They're not touchy. Because they know that the world doesn't revolve around them. That's what it means to be humble. You recognize that the world doesn't revolve around you. That's not always easy. Some of you are probably thinking, well, I've never heard that before. <laughs> I thought everything revolved around me. Listen, anyone who takes themselves too serious is going to live a restless life. 
I'll tell you why. Because the only one who is worthy to be taken serious is Jesus alone. If you take yourself too, too serious, you're going to be discouraged when people don't kiss your feet. You're going to be discouraged when men don't praise you and compliment you. Why? Because you weren't made to be praised. Jesus is the only one worthy to be praised. And so anybody who wants that, who desires and craves that, is going to live a restless life, guaranteed. Guaranteed. If you want to take anything serious, take God's word serious. Take God's ways serious. Take Jesus serious. Take God serious. Don't take yourself too serious. You take yourself too serious and you're going to hurt people around you starting with yourself. The meek trust in God for promotions. The meek trust in God for raises, for promotions, for positions. Not only do, do they trust in God for these things, but they're perfectly fine if they never come. I wanted that. I desired that. I prayed for that. But God didn't give it to me. He's God. I'm not. He knows I don't. That is the meek individual. That's humility. They don't scrape and scrap for better and higher positions. They just trust in God. They know, they know that the promotions come from God, not from the east or the west or the south, but from the north, as the scripture says. All promotions come from the Lord. And listen to me, the meek individual is happy in the valley low or on the mountaintops. As long as Christ is with them, he is a happy man. He doesn't need to be a manager of a company. He doesn't have to have that high seat. He'll take the low seat and he'll smile. Why? Because his boss is Christ. The one he serves is Jesus. Whether he's making $5 an hour or $50 an hour, Jesus Christ is his boss. And he's happy about that. He's happy about that. They don't claw. They don't rake everything in for themselves. They just trust in God for bread one day at a time. One day at a time, Lord. That is the meek-spirited individual. The truly meek are content with where the Lord has them and what position the Lord has provided for them. They're content. They're happy inside. And I'm going to share a humbling marriage moment with you. A few years back, I remember telling Marla, Babe, I don't think I'm getting paid enough. I was complaining. I do that too, right? Sometimes. And I said, and she says, she gave me a golden response. She says, oh. She says, um, well, if you, if you don't think you're getting paid enough, then you're not grateful for what God has chosen to pay you. I was like, okay. All right, we'll talk later. You know what I'm saying? That was enough. But that's the heart of a meek individual. Whatever comes from God is good with me. Amen? And it's not to say that we become lazy or we don't try to get ahead in life because, hey, the Lord doesn't like lazy. And he doesn't bless lazy neither. Learn from the ant. They work very hard. Be one of those, spiritually speaking. Right? The meek don't seek revenge. Because they know that God is the ultimate just and just avenger. The meek understand and realize that nothing escapes the eyes of God. Nothing escapes the view of God's eyes. And they know that He's going to act perfectly and in the perfect way and in His perfect timing. And once we really understand that, Whenever you're in a situation where you just want to cock back your fist and let it go, you want to get yours, right? At that moment, just remember there's a God in heaven who is in control of that situation right now. Right now. You and I want it to happen right away, like God do something now or I'm going to do something. One of us has got to do something. Not the meek man. Not the meek woman. They trust that God will avenge them. 
And at this time, our fluttering hearts can rest assured. The meek say in their hearts, God's got my situation in his loving hands. He knows my case. Come what may, the Lord is large and in charge. They don't try to scheme and cause things to happen in a wicked way. The meek don't have, I must get even brewing in their hearts or ruminating in their minds. I'm not letting that go. She's going to get hers. He's going to get his. No. As soon as that prideful, arrogant thought comes into your mind, you smash it in prayer. Because the Lord teaches us to do so. It's what it means to be meek. It's not an easy thing. It takes time. It takes growth. It takes humbling oneself day by day before the Lord. And as you do that day by day, He gives you more of His nature, more of His character. Amen? The meek have a good handle on their tongue and a fine filter on their words. The meek individual doesn't let anything fly through their teeth. I'll tell you that right now. Because they understand the power of words. They understand that words stick around for a long time, both in the mind of God and the mind of those who hear you speak. And they understand what they're capable of doing and destroying. And they know that words also encourage and build people up. And so they're, they're wise about what they say. They think three times before they speak once. Why? Because they're meek. They're humble. I don't want to hurt you, so I'll just shut up and go before God and ask Him to give me better words and a better response. And I'll come back later. And I might say something that will heal this relationship. Make sense? This is what it means to be a humble individual. The meek don't have to win every argument, right? The meek don't have to win every argument. They don't always have to force their uh, opinions on others and their, they don't always have to force their point across like I'm right all the time. Like shut up, hear me. <laughs> the meek are not like that. The meek understand that everybody is, especially believers, right brothers and sisters in Christ, they understand that everybody's growing at a different pace. And there are different understandings and different levels of maturity and all of the fruit of the Spirit. And so they, they live that way. They think that way. They're not like these, what is that, an elephant in a china shop, you know, just breaking everything, pushing their weight around on people. No. They're careful. They don't want to break anything, especially God's heart. Amen? Amen. The meek are quick to listen. The meek are quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. That reminds us of a Bible verse, doesn't it? James 1.19. You see, the prideful, they don't got time to hear the whole story. They don't got time to hear the whole complaint. They don't got time to hear the whole riddle because they already got the answer. They're waiting for you just to be quiet so they can start speaking. Not with the meek. The meek sits down, hears the story, and thoughtfully makes a decision or a conclusion or shares a, a word of wisdom. Right? The humble individual listens. He listens. He listens carefully before he says anything. That's not always easy to do. And then again, he's slow to anger. The meek are marked by Proverbs chapter 14, verses 29 to 30. I'll read it to you. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty or quick temper, listen, exalts folly. We don't want to exalt folly. We want to exalt wisdom. We want to exalt Jesus Christ and His ways, right? So he says, don't be short-fused. Don't be quick to crinkle your forehead and raise your voice and shake your fist. Be quick to be calm and collected, honoring God because He's worthy. Amen?
The meek are teachable and moldable. They remain students of God and His awesome ways their entire life. The thing that God doesn't like is when we become know-it-alls. We think we know it all, but we don't. And even the little we know, we don't know too much about. Trust me. We're growing in the knowledge of God day by day. But they're moldable, they're teachable. Psalm 25 and verse 9, The humble, he, speaking of God, guides in justice. In other words, he guides them to do what is right. Who? The humble, the meek. And then it goes on to say here, And the humble, he teaches his way. In other words, it's the meek individual that God can teach and that God can guide. Why? Because the prideful individual already has his path, already has his ways. Don't be telling me what to do. I don't care what the Bible says. Got my own way, right? But the humble individual is like putty or like soft, moldable clay in the hands of the potter. But the prideful individual is like a rock, a solid, hard rock that needs to be crushed with a sledgehammer. God desires that we would be moldable and teachable, that He would be able to instruct us in His ways. The Word of God impacts the meek. If the Word of God is not impacting your life, it's because you're not meek. That's a measure to know what kind of disciple you truly are. But if the Word of God are like hands and they're molding you as you're the clay in the center of God's wheel or will, and you're just like that clay, you're not saying anything because you don't got a mouth. And you're just twirling in His hands and you're saying, Lord, whatever you want to do with me. Are there any rough edges, God? Smooth them out. Fill me up with your living waters and use me as an honorable vessel. Listen, that's what God wants from every student, every servant of His. Can I get an amen? Amen. The Word of God only impacts the meek. That's what He says here. I can guide them and I can teach them. Why? Because they're meek. Because they're meek. The meek person doesn't have a fussy spirit. The meek person doesn't have a fussy spirit. A spirit that secretly complains. A spirit that secretly craves and wars and plots and plans and rages and envies. No. Those things come up. Those things go down. Amen? The prideful always seem to have a storm raging within them. They don't have a sense of, they don't have a sense of ease. They're always uneasy. They're always unsettled while the humble are calm and serene like a perfectly still lake with tiny ripples here and there because no one is as perfect as Christ. Which is our goal. There are too many people with a fussy spirit because they just want and they want and they want and they want and they want. And they can't have because James, the book of James tells us because they ask and they ask to spend those things on themselves. It's pride, pride, pride. They got a fussy spirit always warring within themselves about what they can't have instead of being happy for what God has truly provided. Amen? Amen. We find here in 1 Peter 3, 4, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incomparable beauty, incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. The hidden person of the heart. What is your heart like? What is your heart life like? The place that nobody can see until you start speaking and start acting, start doing. So this quiet spirit is the opposite of a fussy spirit or a a spirit that, that 
that gives out tantrums or that is jittery or wild or stormy inside. It says, which is, a very pres- which is very precious in the sight of God. That quiet spirit is very precious in the sight of God. Now, this is referring to a godly woman, but this pertains to godly men as well. We both have an inner life. How are you doing? How are you doing? If you're calm and collected today, that's because you are growing in the power of the Holy Spirit in those areas. Amen? Well, we have still another day to go, guys. <laughs> kind of joking. In the third beatitude, Jesus seems to echo Psalm 37:11. But Psalm 37:9-11 says this, if you would like to turn your Bibles to Psalm 37:9-11. If you don't have a Bible, no worries, just pay close attention. Psalm 37, 19, 11 says this, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. Stop there for a moment. You see, the wicked, the prideful, they think that they're going to enjoy eternal praise. Permanent positions and properties. But the Bible here tells us that they won't. The prideful won't. It is the meek that inherit the earth. It's been said that when Alexander the Great saw the breadth of his domain, he wept, for there were no more worlds to conquer. Where is he at now? Where is his throne? Where is his kingdom? Well, the Bible says here, no more cut off. No more cut off. Thirsty and hungry for power and authority. God says, nope. All authority is mine. You better humble yourself below me, the Lord says through his word. We continue reading here. But the meek, this is the passage I was referring to, 11. But the meek shall inherit the earth. Jesus basically preached this verse verbatim. And shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. In Psalm 37 and verse 22, it says, Those blessed by God shall inherit the earth. But those that are cursed by God shall be cut off. In this chapter, Psalm 37, God describes the wicked, the prideful, as those who bring wicked schemes to pass. Always working behind the scenes to get what they want. But, it says of the humble and the meek, that they commit their way to the Lord and the Lord shall bring it to pass. You see that? The prideful want to bring it to pass. The meek, they say, nope, God's in charge. He'll bring it to pass. I don't need to fight anybody for it. I don't need to fight anyone for it. I trust in the Lord. He's got my back. Amen? The wicked fret over and fight for their lustful desires while the meek rest and feed on God's faithfulness. What are you eating? Psalm 37. The meek feed on God's faithfulness. Not on their own dealings, not on their own ways and their own connivings. No, they just say, God is faithful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy that. I'm going to eat that. I'm going to make that my life's bread. His faithfulness, He's good to me. He knows me. He knows what I need, even before I pray it. He's got the hairs on my head numbered. He knows me. He loves me. He cares for me. I feed on His faithfulness. I don't feed on my pride. I don't feed on my own ways, on my own schemes. I feed on Him, His character, His perfection, His goodness. The wicked say, I'll make it happen. The meek say, God will make it happen. 
God will see it through. God is on my side. All according to his perfect pleasure. All according to his perfect timing. That's the meek individual. Whatever God wants, that's what I want. Whatever God wants, that's what I want. And by the way, in Psalm 37, we find two reoccurring points. Number one, the meek will live on forever, while the prideful and the wicked, those who lust for the upper hand, will die off. And number two, we find here that the wicked schemes, plots, plans, evil against others. They are power grabbers. They are position seekers. They are attention getters. But the meek look to trust in, wait on, depend upon, and rest in the Lord's will. Which one are we? Which one are we growing in? The truly meek say, not my will, but your will be done. Even in the garden of Gethsemane, even in the garden of great trials in life, not my will, but your will be done, O oh God. And they mean it. Because there are far too many Christians who say that, not my will, but God's will be done. It sounds very religious and pious and strong, doesn't it? But then here comes the Garden of Gethsemane. You're like, whoa, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't mean that, Lord. I didn't expect that trouble, that trial. I did say your will, but not that, anything but that. You see, those who are truly, truly meek, whatever you give me, Lord, whether it's life in abundance or death today, your will be done. Your will be done. Amen? And that's the reason why their drums stacked one upon the other. You can't skip poor in spirit and you can't skip the morning over your sin or else you'll never get to meekness you try to get to meekness the third step on the ladder the third drum on the pillar the third piece of clothing of Christ's character forget about it there's no skipping these spiritual levels if you will it's one at a time build them up start at the bottom poor in spirit We don't want to start at the top because we can't. The prideful conspire, connive and claw to get what they want. But the weak waits upon the Lord. He wants what God wants because God knows it all. God knows best. God has the universe in His hands. He knows it. Listen, the prideful, the prideful takes matters into his own hands while the meek put their problems in the hands of God. That's the difference right there. The prideful, right here. I'm in control of everything. They think they are. They think they are until something bad happens. Oh, I didn't know my tire was going to be flat today or I didn't know that this was going to happen in my life. You're in control of everything until everything gets out of control. And then you're like, okay. All right, there's someone greater, bigger, and smarter, and wiser than me. Where is he? Right? And so, but the prideful man, again, he, he wants to be in control of everything. The meek man puts everything in God's control. Every, just, Lord, I trust you. Yeah, we do things, we make things happen, we do our part, but yet we trust in God every step of the way. Can I get an amen? When the meek are wronged by others, they don't seek revenge. They simply recognize that God has allowed the wrong or the injury towards them for a reason. Somebody has done you wrong, God is involved with that. Remember Joseph? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. The meek individual understands that. They get punched in the face, there's a reason for it. They get their house robbed, there's a reason for it. They get cussed out at in public, there's a reason for it. God works all things together for good. God is doing something in the hard times and the hardships of life. The meek individual understands that. Somehow he's going to turn this pain into joy. Somehow God's going to turn these ashes into beauty. This morning into weeping and dancing. Somehow. Amen? And we don't have to know everything. I can't look behind the curtains of heaven, I'll tell you that. I would like to. I would like to know the ending from the beginning like God, or maybe not. But God knows all things and I trust Him with it. Amen? 
You see, the meek individual, come with me, he just knows God's involved. God's involved in everything and he's doing something with it for our good and his glory. How many can say we serve a good God? Give him praise in this house today. He's worthy. Yes. I'm almost finished here in about an hour. The, the, first, the very first time, <laughs> I see people yawning. Hey, no yawning. <laughs> I'm messing with you. The very first time that we find the word meekness in the Bible refers to Moses. We find that in the book of Numbers. It refers to Moses. Now tell me if this is not the greatest compliment that God can ever give an individual. I mean, the other person that he complimented so amazingly was obviously his son and, and Job. Right? He told the devil, ain't no man like this guy right here. And then the devil was like, oh yeah, let's test him, you know. But Moses, on the other hand, the Bible says that he was the most meek, the most humble person in all the earth. Like, I don't even know what that looks like. Like, I can't even imagine that level of meekness, to be quite honest with you. But yet the Bible says that he was the most meek in all the world. And there was a situation, an incident, where his older brother Aaron and his older sister Miriam verbally attacked Moses. They began to question his leadership. They began to question his connection and his relationship with God. In the book of Numbers chapter 12 and verse 2 and 3 it says this. This is Aaron and Miriam talking about their leader, the man that God has chosen. Their evil hearts are being exposed with these words. Listen, they say, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? They asked, has he also spoken, hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this, it says. And then it says, now Moses was a very meek man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Aaron and Miriam's level of humility didn't reach his ankles. I mean, this man was humble. He wasn't a power grabber. He wasn't after authority and position like, like Aaron and Miriam were. Oh, God is you know, only using you, you know, and Sometimes we can fall into that trap when God is blessing a sister or a brother. Oh, Lord, you know, who do they think they are? And, you know, start mumbling and grumbling. And God's like, I hear you. And it says here, and the Lord heard this. Remember I told you when you read scripture, pay attention to what God says. When you read a passage like that. Stay there for an hour, seriously, and just pray, and just think, and meditate, and ponder. Okay, okay, and the Lord heard this. What does that tell you? The Lord hears every prideful word that comes out of our mouths. The Lord hears and knows every prideful motive and thought, and listen, the Lord was angry with Aaron and Miriam, so much so that he struck her with leprosy for seven days. He says, get her out of the camp. Get her out of the camp. Seven days, his sister. And do you think Moses says, she deserved it, Lord. Strike Aaron too. That's more like us. Not him. He didn't say a word. And God knew he wouldn't say a word. And that's why God had to step in because Moses was too humble. He wasn't going to defend himself. He wasn't going to fight with his brother and his sister. He understood their low level of humility. He understood who he was in God. And he wasn't going to pick up his fist and swing. So God said, I'll step in, Moses. You're too calm. And it's not to say that he's more calm than God, but God is just. And God will do what is right all the time. Right? And so he strikes her. Why did he strike Miriam and not Aaron? My guess is she led in the verbal attack. 
My guess is this young lady encouraged her brother Aaron to go after Moses. That's my opinion. Could be another reason. But we see here that God hears. God knows the humble heart. God knows the prideful heart. He knows what's being thought of throughout the day, in the evening, in the morning. He knows. And if he's not pleased, it's repent of those things. If he is pleased, then praise the Lord. Amen? Yes. Like Moses, a meek person is something of a punching bag. Some of you heard that and said, I ain't no punching bag. You won't inherit the earth if you're not a punching bag. Listen to me closely. Moses was something of a punching bag, which means that he was able to absorb punches. He was able to endure the hits, the swings from his brother and his sister. He did it all in love. But instead of giving his pain over to revenge, he gave his pain over to God. That's how you know if you're meek. If your pain causes you to strike back, you're nothing like Moses. And you're nothing like Christ. But if you say, Lord, I'm going to take this one for you, Lord. And I'm going to try to somehow be a good testimony to those that are hurting me, Lord. Give me the strength, Holy Spirit, to endure these people and their wickedness towards me. They don't just take people's junk. They take it only to give it to God. So that way he can deal with it. That's what Moses did. After this attack on him and his leadership, Moses didn't wish harm on his siblings. In fact, what did he do? He prayed for Miriam. He didn't just pray. The Bible says he cried out. He was weeping. Lord, please, it's my sister. I don't want to see her like a leprous for seven days. Heal her, God. Moses didn't even want God to strike her. He wanted to heal her on the spot. God says, no, no, no. She has to pay for what she said and what she did to you, Moses. Outside, seven days. Bring her back in after that. That's what it means to be meek. You pray for your enemies. They wish harm on you. You pray for them. They want to take you out. You pray for them. And you leave everything in the hands of God. Amen? It's not always easy to do because sometimes we think we're God. And we can take matters into our own hands. That is not the character of Christ. Not my will but your will be done, O Lord. Blessed are those, blessed are the meek for they and they alone will inherit the earth. By the way, Moses didn't leave Egypt to become Israel's hero. Moses was a meek man. He didn't leave Egypt to be the king of Israel. He left Egypt to be a servant leader. A servant leader. He left Egypt and all of its pomp to struggle with God's people. That's meekness. It's meekness. Yeah, that looks good right there. It's tempting, but I don't want it. Because I'd rather suffer with God's people. You keep that. You keep that. I'm going to go the hard way. I'm going to suffer with God's people. I'm going to live that difficult Christian life. For the glory of Christ and for the love of those watching me. Amen? And that right there was Moses' heart. Hebrews 11, 24, 26 says, By faith, when he became of age, when he grew up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Think about that for a moment. He says, I don't want to be the prince of Egypt. I don't want to be the next Pharaoh. I don't want to be the next king. I don't want to be a part of this Egyptian system. This idolatrous, worldly, God-hating system. He says, I don't want it. I don't care how fine the clothing is. I don't care about how many stars the hotels have there. I don't care about the chariots and how beautiful and great they're made. I don't want anything that Egypt has to offer. And it says here, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. 
esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. The meek don't want sin right now. I want the cross life. I want the painful life. I want the self-denying life. I want Christ to be exalted in Christ alone. Amen? And it says there that he left all the passing pleasures of sin and, and greater, it was gr greater riches for him to suffer in the wilderness. Think about that. Remember everything he went through in the wilderness? Waiting for um, pigeons to come and for the people to be fed, quails I should say, waiting for the manna to come. When he was in Egypt at the snap of a finger, like get that pie done real quick and put a cherry on top. To so, know, I'm going to suffer with these people. I'm going to show them what it means to follow God. I'm going to lead by example. That is what it means to be meek. And he says he looked forward to the reward. What reward? To be with Christ. And listen, to inherit the earth. He says, I'm letting go of Egypt, but I'm getting the new heavens, and I'm getting the new earth, and I'm getting Christ. Yeah, I might struggle for a 40 years in the wilderness, but something good is coming after this. And 40 years don't compare to eternity and glory. I'll take it. I'll take the hardship. I'll take the cross. I'll take it. One thing I won't give up is Christ and what He has for me in the future. Amen? Amen. Amen. Lastly, let's take a sneak peek at the Master of Meekness, Jesus our Lord. I would like you to turn your Bibles to Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. This would be our last passage. Jesus says, and I want you to hear these words as though he's talking directly to you, because he is. He says this, take my yoke upon you. Stop there for a moment. A yoke is an instrument that farmers use to connect two oxen. So that way they would walk a straight line, pair up, and work together as a team. The Lord is saying here, walk with me, side by side. The Lord is telling you this morning, work with me, side by side. I'll make sure the line's straight. I'll make sure the work's done, but stay right next to me. Stay right next to me, all right? And then he goes on to say here, and learn from me. In other words, the Lord wants you so close to Him that He is able to pour wisdom and instruction into your ear. That close. The distance where all He has to do is whisper into your ear. And the words go in. The words go in. By the way, it says, and learn from me. At this point, the, the main religious teachers and leaders were the Pharisees and the scribes. The Pharisees and the scribes. And they were devils in sheep's clothing. And the Lord says, mm -mm. Learn. Learn from me, He tells them. Learn from me. He says, For I am gentle and lowly in heart. In other words, I am meek and lowly in heart. The heart is where all motives are born. Is where all desires come from. And he says, I've got a lowly heart. I've got a meek and humble heart. And then he says, and you will find rest for your souls. Are you fussy today inside of you? Are you fighting and worrying for stuff and things and positions and seats? And praise and likes and loves and comments and views. The Lord says, learn from me. I don't need it. That's not my food. That's not my food. He says, you'll find rest for your souls. Rest inside. Totally content. Think about the beauty of that promise. 
I'm content. I don't need anything. I'm fulfilled by the person of Christ and the heart that beats inside my chest, which is His. And you will find rest for your souls, He says. In other words, living like Jesus is the cure for a fussy spirit and a restless attitude. His heart is the cure to mood swings and prideful, sinful cravings. His heart is the cure to all the things that rage within your soul and your heart and your mind. All the things you want that are no good for you. The Lord says, I will calm your heart. I will calm your restless heart. The Pharisees loved the best seats in the house and did whatever it took to get them. Jesus took the most painful seat in the world on the cross. Where his backside was, there was a piece of wood to hold him up on that cross. It was the throne of suffering. And he sat on that cross as the king of suffering. And he was exalted on that seat. While the Pharisees wanted the best place in the house, give me the best chair, give me the best foods, give me the best place on that table, Jesus said, give me the cross. Give me the cross. I want to do everything opposite these prideful men. I want these people to know what it means to follow God the Father. Amen? And so that's what the people learned. Their spiritual leaders were power grabbers. They were hungry for praise, for position. And they didn't know what to do with that. They were uneasy in their hearts, like we can't even, don't even. And Jesus says, no, that's not the way, this is the way. It's not the way, this is the way. They loved to be called rabbi and teacher by the common people. They loved titles. They loved recognition. They loved it. And they felt disrespected if you didn't call them rabbi. They felt disrespected if you didn't stop and tilt your neck and say hi. They thought they were something. But the Bible says that Jesus didn't look for the praise of men because he knew what, what was in them already. Why is, he going to get, why is he going to look for the praise of wicked men? Jesus says, no, I only praise my Father. But these Pharisees, they cared about who they were, the accomplishments they attained, the titles that they wore. When it was time to give, they made sure everybody knew it. They put the water in a rubber, rubber band and then dropped it for everyone to see, especially the poor lady with the two mites. Like, look this here. Look at this here. And that's what they were learning. The Lord says, no, not like that. Don't show off your Christianity. Don't show off your spiritual maturity. Don't try to impress anybody with anything you do and anything you are. Because it all comes from God. Amen? And by the way, I've learned that God cannot be impressed. He's the only one worthy to be impressed and he cannot be impressed. So why bother trying to impress people? <laughs> it's a waste of time and energy. The Pharisees made sure that you knew they were fasting. They disfigured their faces and walked around town and prayed on the corner. Long, repetitious prayers for everybody to hear and everybody to see and everybody to praise. Lord says, learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And Isaiah says that Jesus didn't raise his voice in the streets on purpose to be heard and seen and praised by men. Never. Not one time did he do anything for a that a boy. Not one time did he do anything for a high five. Not one time did he do anything for a like. Nothing. All he wanted was to please the Father perfectly. That's the freeing life. That's the freeing life. 
They greeted only those that praised them. They were full of partiality. They were kind to the rich, but they were mean to the poor. And some of us may say, well, that's not me. It is you if you only hang around with those you like to hang around with. You're just like the Pharisee. But if you can get a little uncomfortable, get a little dirty, be around people who annoy you, be around people who disagree with you, then you are a meek man. If people that, quote unquote, are less than you in your eyes and you can't be around them, you're just like the Pharisee. But if you can be like Jesus Christ and be called a friend of sinners, then you're like Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen? What did the Lord say to do? Go into the highways and the byways. Go into the rejected. Go to those who are rejected of society, outcast. The Lord is basically saying, love everyone the same, just as I have loved everyone the same. Amen? Amen. But they learned these things from the Pharisees, and Jesus comes in and says, no, learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The Bible says that the Pharisees love the praise of men rather than the praise of God. Listen to this. This is like the, the ultimate act of idolatry. They were deifying themselves. In other words, they saw themselves as more important than God himself. They said, we should get the praise, not him. Secretly in their hearts. That's the way they thought. And that's what the word says about them. And these are the people that, the, that this is all that the people had to work with. Like, that's religion. That is just awful. They love to show off their religious, their dead religious abilities before others. Jesus was the opposite. Jesus was the opposite says they will inherit the earth. That's the promise you have today. You're poor in spirit, heaven is yours. You mourn over your sin, you get comforted. Are you meek this morning? The earth is yours. No more fussing, no more fighting, no more complaining. The earth is yours and the fullness of it. In 1 Corinthians, we find the Apostle Paul, he, he, he had to correct the church there. They were boasting about what preacher was better. And he says to them, don't you know that all things are yours, he tells them? All things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, he tells them, all things are yours. Stop fighting. You're going to get your prize. Just wait on the Lord. You're going to get your crowns. You're going to rule the earth as princes and princesses as rulers, as governors, as priests, as kings, the Bible says. But don't reach for the crown now. Take the crown of thorns first. And the meek will get a crown of gold in the end. Amen? The prideful may get the best seat in the house, but they will not inherit the earth. The prideful may get the respect Recognition and praise they so crave and fight for, but they will not inherit the earth. The prideful may get that high position they've pulled selfish strings to get and gain, but they will not inherit the earth. The prideful may dominate, suppress, and impress for a time, but they will not inherit the earth. The prideful may get a name for themselves, but they will not inherit the earth. And the prideful and powerful may even conquer the entire globe, the entire world, and even they will not inherit the earth. Just like Alexander the Great. But blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. We're going to close with a song. I want to take this time as they prepare their, as they make their way up. I want to encourage you guys here today. I know that so much was said. This was a very packed message. I know that. But I'm praying and believing that there was something that was said that, that can linger in your heart and in your mind. Something you can reflect on. And so I just want to take this moment right now. 
There's far too many people just hitting and running. I don't want to do that in this ministry. I want to give the Lord his time. I want the Holy Spirit to do his work. I want the word of God to grow in power. And so I'm going to ask everyone here today just to take a moment, take a minute, and you can bow your head if you'd like, but just take a moment and reflect on what was said and pray. In the areas where you lack, we all lack somewhere. In the areas where you lack, just say, Lord, make me meek right there, right there. You, you struck it today. Make me meek right there, right there, Lord, I am guilty. All right, so let's just take a moment. And I want you to talk to the Lord right where you are. If you're moved to apologize, apologize. If you're moved to thank the Lord for what he is doing in your life, then do that. But let's just take a moment to reflect in God's word. Father, we thank you for your word. We're not going to take ourselves serious, Lord, too serious. We will take you serious, Lord. Help us to be meek and lowly in heart so that we might find rest for our souls. Do a work in all of us, Lord. There are some here who, have, who haven't even started with the first drum to be poor in spirit and recognize their poverty and their need for Jesus. And there are some who don't mourn over their sin. And for that reason, meekness is not produced in abundance. Help us, Lord. Make your word real to us. Make your word work. Make it effective in us, we pray. We recognize that you're here right now. And we humble ourselves before you, Lord. As you walk the halls of our hearts and examine us, who can hide from your fiery eyes 